hands before the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. We just bless you, Lord. We thank you. We thank you for your word. Your word is truth, Father. We rest in your promises because they are yes and they are amen. We have a history with you, Lord. Some of us have a history longer than others, but our history with you is faithfulness. You are a faithful God. And we welcome you, the faithful God, the faithful Father, the faithful Savior, the faithful healer, the faithful restorer, the faithful comforter, the faithful encourager. Oh, we thank you. We welcome you into this place today. I thank you, Father, that there's a spirit of victory in this house tonight. There's a spirit of victory in this house tonight in the name of Jesus. We are more than conquerors. We are more than conquerors. Say that out of your mouth. Say, I'm more than a conqueror. Say, I'm more than a conqueror. I'm more than a conqueror. In Christ Jesus. Oh. Lord, we thank you. There's not one trial. There's not one bad report. There's not one mountain that is too big for you or too big for us. You have filled us with your Holy Ghost. You've filled us with your power. Woo. Say, I'm an overcomer. Oh, say it like you mean it. Say, I'm an overcomer. Say, I'm filled with God. I'm filled with His love. And that love is perfect. And it casts out fear. Now, in Jesus' name, say, I'm more than victorious in Christ. His anointing is in me. It's on me, and it's working for me right now. Glory to God. Now just lift up your hands. Just lift up your hands. You can have a seat if you want. You don't have to if you don't want to. Glory to God. We're just going to dive in, and then we'll worship. Is that all right? I like changing things up a little bit. Come on, preacher. We welcome our live stream audience. It is such a blessing having you here with us. We pray that everything that happens here supernaturally, it occurs in your home, your vehicles, wherever you're listening. In the name of Jesus, we just speak blessings. And I speak blessings to you. Glory to God. Y'all ready? Yes. You ready for the word? Yes. The word is truth. Yes. Amen. It's final authority. Yes. Amen. So, um... We've been talking about I don't care. It's ringing just a little bit. I don't know why. Um, year, a few years back, Brother Copeland, I think it was Monty Walsh. Is it Monty Walsh, Rick? I can't tell you. Name yeah. Name. I can't tell you how much I don't care. And people nowadays, some people would say that, and you'd be like, oh, you don't care? <laughs> right? Yep, yeah, I don't care. I just choose not to. Amen. Amen. So we got to choose not to care. We got to choose. You have a choice. I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit. You have to choose something wrong. Is my hair in the way? I'm good. All right. Well, you have to choose. We have to choose what we think. Amen. You choose. Say, I choose. I choose. Glory to God. So I get to talk about victim mentality. Aren't you excited? So just, I'm going to just. I'm, I have the grace of God and the anointing that's on Keith Moore <laughs> to, to touch on this subject and make you feel wonderful when you walk out the door. Amen? It's so one thing is I love about Keith Moore is he can just go in there and do this massive surgery and you're like, oh, and then you walk out somehow feeling amazing. And you're going to do that tonight. You're going to feel encouraged when you leave this Amen. place because the Holy Spirit is going to speak. Amen. I yield myself to him. He's going to give me utterance. Amen. It'll be the perfect words. So overcoming victim mentality. We got to overcome it because it's everywhere. It's part of our world. Where is our focus? That's the first question that we have to ask. Where is our focus? Our mindset has much to do with our focus 
where our focus is and our attention and where it is toward. Yeah. So what your, perce- your perspective and the perception that you have, Come where on. you're sitting, where you're looking from, has a big, big influence yeah. on your focus and right. where your attention is. Okay? So if I'm looking at a mountain, and I, I used to work on cruise ships, and I had one summer I got to work in Alaska. It was beautiful. I don't know what's happening. If I need to switch to handheld, let me know. Um, and it was beautiful, but I got to hike mountains. And one mountain that we went to was um, you hike to the top of it, and on one side it was green, on the other side it was a glacier. It was beautiful. Okay, but my perspective of that mountain is vastly different at the foot of that mountain than it is when I'm on the top. On the top, you want to sing, the hills are alive. (laughs) On the bottom, you want to say, oh, Jesus, help me, right? And it's okay. Ask for Jesus. He loves to help. What we think on the most is the direction that we're going to go. So what takes up most of your time in your thoughts is the direction you're going to go. So we yeah. got to change the direction that we're going. If we're going in a not good, if you're, if you're having obstacle after obstacle after obstacle after obstacle and you don't feel like you're breaking free or you end up in this cycle, hallelujah, you end up in this cycle, then we have to break free from that cycle, amen? We got to figure out, okay, where's our perspective? Where are we viewing our life from? Are we viewing it at the bottom of the mountain or are we viewing it from the top of the mountain? So first... We need to identify the focus of our soul. Amen? Your soul is your mind, your will, and your emotions. There's only two ways that you can focus your soul. It's either upward or it's inward. Only two. So God makes it really easy. He's wired our soul, our mind, our will, our emotions. So simple. So either our focus is upward or it's inward. Now, if it's upward, then it's going to be outward because God is about people. So for those of you who are like, wait a minute, we could think outward. Yes. But the only way you can do that effectively is if you're upward. Amen? You're not thinking of anybody else but yourself if you're inward. So that's a little bit ouchy. We're kind of in an eye epidemic, iTunes. I am an Apple person, so it's okay. I have an iPhone. I have an iPad. I want an iMac. Are there any other eyes? An eye watch? Is that what it's called? Yes. Oh, it's called an Apple Watch. But it's the same as an iPhone, right? It's just right here. Okay? Whoever or whatever is at the center of your daily thoughts is your God. Either capital G-O-D or lowercase G-O-D. You choose. You choose. You choose, and it has to be an active thing. We have to constantly keep this thing right here submitted to our hearts. It is constant. If you aren't constantly focused on God, if you're not constantly making a conscious effort to keep your focus on Him, then it is too easy. You're going to be thinking inward before you know it. It's just a fact of life. It really is. 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 3. Let's turn to there. Just getting warmed up. Talking about victim mentality. How are we going to overcome it? Amen? First, we've got to identify what it is. <clears throat> First Timothy 3, 1 through 3. You should know this, Timothy, that in the last days there will be very difficult times. For people will love only themselves and their money. They will be boastful and proud, scoffing at God, disobedient to parents and ungrateful. They will consider nothing sacred. They will be unloving and unforgiving, and they will slander others and have no self-control. They will be cruel and hate what is good. Is that now? That's the world that we live in. We're not of this world, but we live in it. Um, All right, so this world is constantly influencing us. Amen? Constantly. So if you're not active, like I said, if you're not active in keeping your thoughts in check, you're, co- you're going to have the pressure of the world. You will go in the direction of the world if you're not focused on the right thing, okay? 
So I have three areas of victim mentality. There's probably more, but there's not enough time to go into all of it. And personally, I don't want to focus on victim mentality. I want to set you up for next week's message on victor mentality. Amen? But I'm going to give you three different ones. The first one here, for those of you who take notes, it's all about me culture. That's the first one. It's all about me. We say it. It's all about you in our home, but um, it's all about me culture. When we think with the I mindset, we become our own God. We adopt a mentality that I can solve this problem. I can provide for my family. I can run a country, for those who think they can. I can do better than God can. That's what the I mindset. I know this is ouchy at first, but it'll get fun, I promise. That's what you're saying. It's as if we tell God in not so many words that he has missed it. We could do a better job with our lives and the lives of the others and the lives of our nation. Amen? That's ouch, right? So I'm going to give you one example of I thinking, okay, in today's society. It's very relevant. Let's take texting and driving, okay? Okay. You're probably thinking, how is that I mentality? I'm going to show you. Of the 2.5 million people in the U.S. that are involved in accidents each year, 1.6 million of those accidents involve a cell phone. That's 64% of the road accidents in the U.S. 64%. Now, that's not just texting. That's doing whatever else we do on our phones. Amen? Each year, over 330,000 accidents caused by texting while driving lead to severe injuries. Severe injuries. Raise your hand if you've ever heard of someone um, being in a severe accident, be it on the news or you know of somebody that was in an accident, um, maybe even a death occurred because someone was texting and driving. Raise your hand. Okay, so we don't have news watchers around here, I guess. Okay, you've never heard of that? You've never heard of someone? Okay, all right. Raise, Raise your hand. On the news, that's fine. Yeah, on the news. Okay, all right, yeah. It's, a, it's bad, right? So all of us have been aware of it, right? Okay. One out of four car accidents in the U.S. are caused by texting and driving. One-fourth. Every day, 11 teenagers die because they were texting while driving. How many of those teenagers watched mom and dad text and drive and do all their things on their phone while they're... Right? Driving. Yes. I'll tell you that right there. This is just a nugget. We work with your youth, so <laughs> this is just a little plug. Kids watch. They're watching you. They, they watch whether or not you stop at the stop sign, and they're watching your phone activity when you're driving. So I'm just going to give you, that's just a little nugget. That's free. How many of us still choose to pick up our phone when we drive? I won't make you raise your hand, but just come on. I, yes. I, I have to consciously say, no, I'm not answering that. Or I, I'm, I tell one of my girls, grab that and tell me if I need to know anything about it. Amen? It's a conscious thing. Yet, how many times do we pick it up? Yet we know people have died because of it. We know big accidents have happened because of it. We know it's not safe. Why do we do it? Because we've got to figure out what's going on. Who's contacting me? Is it something that I need to know? I, 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 I. There's a Christian song. The words of it are really good, but it gets on my nerves because it's like, I, I, da, 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 I, I. It's all about I. And I'm like, get the I out. The chorus is amazing. But the first part, I'm like, uh. I, I, I. So it's an I epidemic. We live in an I, me it world. How many times have you been cut off by someone who you know was on their phone? Because you can tell the swerve, right? How many times have you sat at a green light and they didn't go and their head is down like this? You know, you know, they're not checking their nail beds. No, you know what I'm saying? You know, what is it? I tell my husband all the time. He's like, can you believe they, he, they did that? And I'm like, They're just inward. They're just thinking about themselves, you know? We do it too, so we can't be mad at the other person. Everybody's done it. Amen? Everybody's done it. 
This is just one of many examples of inward thinking. I could name a lot, but this is just an example. And this is a serious example because people die because of it. Yet we're still focused on me. What do I need to get? What messages are coming to me, right? Mm. Just think of it a little bit. The biggest thing the enemy has to work with is our flesh. That's the biggest thing. The nature of the flesh is selfish. And I like what Keith Moore said. He said, all we have to do to be selfish is wake up and yield to you. That's it. You don't have to try to be selfish. You have to try to not be selfish. That's where you have to try. Amen? That's where I have to try. Amen? You have to be active to not be selfish. All you got to do is wake up. I. <laughs> I is right there. I sleeps with you all night long, wakes up with you, eats breakfast with you, waits for someone to get out of the bathroom. I is right there. I is on the way to work with you when you're in traffic. I. I. Selfishness is the hook the enemy uses to get us into failure. It's an inward focus. Amen? The root of it is pride, and the root to pride is fear. All right? So it's icky. Say icky. It's a great word. I like that. Number two, the comparison hook. Comparison. If you've ever been a teenager, you know what comparison is, but... Many adults, we do this too, okay? One of the most dangerous deceptions the enemy uses to try to keep us from fulfilling our destiny is comparison. This is a sneaky little enemy that has a variety of faces. So let's turn to 1 Samuel 8, 4 through 7. I'm going to read from the God's Word translation. Um, I bought one for Michaela a few years back, and I really like it. Um, I just like the way it words some things. This is 1 Samuel 8, 4 through 7. Then all the leaders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah. They told him, you're old and your sons aren't following your example. Now appoint a king to judge us so that we will be like all other nations. But Samuel considered it wrong for them to request a king to judge them. So Samuel prayed to the Lord. The Lord told Samuel, listen to everything the people are saying to you. They haven't rejected you. They've rejected me. Now, if you've ever read through the Old Testament, I've done it a few times, and I get a little depressed once we get into Kings. Yeah, it's like, oh, are you serious? We're going through this again and again and again, right? But what opened the door to this? Appoint a king to judge us so that we will be like all the other nations. They wanted to be like everybody else. Did you know we're not created to be like anybody else? Amen? Israel wasn't created to be like any other nation. God was supposed to be their king. Amen? That's it. Now, they couldn't see God, although they could see, I think, probably more effects of his nature than, than we do on a daily basis because of the way he revealed himself in the Old Testament. However, he wanted to be their king. And don't you think it's good if God is king? Amen? Amen? That's a good life. That means there's never going to be a judgment that comes down upon you that is unjust, right? Or that's working against your good. Mm. But no, they wanted to be like other nations. They saw other nations and said, well, we want that. Amen? I want that. Mm. This set in motion years of turmoil for the people of Israel. For in their future now lies oppression to other kings a lot of bad kings, amen, slavery, toil, wars, hostile takeovers, and the entrance of false gods, amen, and you can read, I encourage you sometime, just, just read the New Testament while you're doing the Old Testament to stay encouraged, but you can read how one king lived for the Lord, the next king didn't, the one king lived for, G for the Lord, the next king didn't, Two kings didn't live for the Lord, then one did. You know, it's just, it was a roller coaster. So the children of Israel went on this roller coaster. Your life could be in a roller coaster because you've chosen to not make God your king. Amen? And it doesn't mean God isn't your savior. It doesn't mean God isn't your friend and you fellowship with him. That has nothing to do with it. You can absolutely do that. But when you make him Lord, 
Amen? Your focus is upward. Amen? And I'm going to say it again. you got to work to keep your focus upward. I have to work to keep my focus upward. I had an opportunity just this couple of weeks to have victim mentality. Even like yesterday and today during moving and cleaning and all that kind of stuff. You know, I didn't want to move when I moved. I was like, why, why can't I just extend the lease a little bit more so we can buy the property we want? You know, it's a whole long story. And I was a little bit, why? Why not? What's wrong with me? Why can't you show me favor? Me, 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 I, I, right? But yet, I'm in a better position now. I'm saving way more money than I would had I stayed in that house. And only God could have come up with a plan of where we're living right now. That's like a whole other story. Only God could have done it. It's actually kind of funny. Only God could have done it, but he knows the plans that he has for us. And we don't understand them. Even right now, in a lot smaller home, I've got lots of stuff that just needs to be pushed to storage. I don't understand why there's so much stuff I just want to get rid of all. But I can't focus on me. I, I have to think upward. There's a reason why I'm here. There's a reason why I'm in this house. There's a reason why I'm in this neighborhood. There's a reason why I'm out of Fort Worth and into Crowley for a season. Why? I'm, I'm there to release the blessing. Amen? That's another, what is that? Upward focus. I haven't done it 24-7. I've gone a little inward the last few days. But if we can just keep upward. Say upward. Amen? Not inward. Amen? Trying to be like someone else is dangerous. So Israel was trying to be like another nation, and it's dangerous. Amen? God did not create you as someone else. He created you as you. Let's go to Psalm 139, 13 through 17. I'm going to read this out of the Amplified. When he made you, he created you. He placed within you everything you need to be a successful you. That's what he did. He's so good. He knows how you're wired together. Amen? Every blood cell that's in your body was wired by God. Think about that. Ooh. Psalm 139, 13 through 17. We thank you, Lord. Amplified. For you did form my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I will confess and praise you for you are fearful and wonderful and for the awful wonder of my birth. Wonderful are your works and that my inner self knows right well. Our inner self, our spirit man knows how good God is. Our inner self knows the goodness of God, knows the power of God. Our inner self wants to go in the direction of God. Amen? Our inner self is crying out to our soul, hey, Get your eyes up. Get your eyes up. Amen. Get your eyes off yourself. Amen. Our spirit, man, if you have been made a believer by choosing Jesus as your Lord and Savior, then your spirit, man, is alive unto God right now. It's this. It's this that gets in the way. This is what we got to train. Nobody else is going to train it for you. You can sit in how many conventions a year. You can come to church every Sunday and every Wednesday and learn about this. And we see it. We see it as ministers. I know Trey, I know Rick, pastors, we've seen it. We've seen people sit in services and they're in the same boat they were in 20 years ago. What, what is that? No growth. But what is that? This has to be trained. Pastor can't train this for you. Amen? Amen? Evangelists can't train this for you. We can only give you food to eat but you've got to be the one to cultivate your faith. Amen? My frame was not hidden from you when I was being formed in secret and intricately and curiously wrought as if embroidered with various colors. In the depths of the earth, a region of darkness and mystery, your eyes saw my unformed substance and in your book, all the days of my life were written before they ever took shape. Oh, feast on that for a little bit. Hmm. Makes that mountain, that mountain's get a little smaller, isn't it? Right? Your book, All the Days of My Life, were written before they ever took shape, when as yet there was none of them. How precious and weighty are your thoughts, oh God. How vast 
is the sum of them. God loves you. He's thinking about you right now. He's got plans. He's working in ways you do not see. He's working on people's hearts. Amen. See, the thing about walking in the promises of God is that we're wired to be part of a body, the body of Christ. So sometimes the Lord's dealing with somebody that's in a different part of the body. Amen. And they may be part of your supply. And I'm not saying just finances. So don't think somebody's going to give you money, although that can easily happen. Your source is him. Amen. But he's wired us together. Every joint supplieth. So you've got to be patient. You've got to walk out the process of life and, and get upward focused because you have a part to play in somebody else's life as well. And if you start doing that, then you don't have time to be a victim. Because you're getting joy helping others. Amen? When we get over into comparing our lives to the lives of others, we can tend to ask ourselves, why can't I have that? Why can't I have that car? How come they have it and I don't, right? Why can't I do that? I want to go travel all over the world and minister. I want to sing on that platform. I've asked myself those questions before. Why is my life not like theirs? How come they have a great marriage and I don't? Mine keeps falling apart. How come they got it right? Hmm, what is that? We're comparing ourselves to somebody else. Um, I'm just, I'm just going to have eating example. We have wonderful family. We have someone on Rick's side of the family that um, <clears throat> just likes to eat whatever he wants to eat. And, you know, sometimes we, we see others eat, you know, real, like fried chicken. I like fried chicken. Raise your hand if you like fried chicken. All right, yeah, we like fried chicken. I look at Brother Jesse and I'm like, I know he eats healthy too, but I know he eats all that fried stuff. And I'm like, why can't I eat that stuff? Because if I eat that stuff, I'm like fast, so I can't eat that stuff, and it's not fair. You see those little bean pole people that can eat whatever they want, right? What is that? Are you one of them right there? Yes. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I'm not mad at you, I promise. <laughs> really. Um, <laughs> You know what I'm saying? And you can get to comparing. And you know what that you know what that does? You go eat fried chicken. <laughs> you go eat that extra bowl of oat, uh, ice cream, not oatmeal. I like oatmeal, but <laughs> Amen. You go eat some Brahms. Amen. Instead of getting the small cone, you get the large. Why? We're comparing ourselves to other. Well, they eat that. I don't know why I did that. I had an eating example. It's God, so hopefully that ministered to somebody. Okay, number three. The stench of entitlement and self-pity. I don't like this one. I don't like it at all. And it's, it's really rampant in our society right now. So we got to press against it by pressing into the Lord. You press against these things by pressing into the Lord. Upward focus. Amen? You don't press against them. I mean, you, you, you need to take authority over those thoughts. You need to take authority over those demonic spirits. But don't spend so much time there. Move on past that into up here. Amen? Your thoughts. Upward focus. Amen? Some people can get caught up in just the authority part and they forget the relationship part. All right, your nature, the flesh, wants to yield to the victim mentality, to feel sorry for yourself. So victor, which you'll learn about next week, means victorious one. Say, I'm a victor. Victim means defeated one. Say, I'm not a victim. Amen? You can die. You can lose your marriage, ruin your finances by giving into the lie of self-pity. You can lose it all. By giving into self-pity, what about me? I love, the, I love the testimony of Brother Copeland. This is years ago, and he walked in the house, and Sister Gloria was saying something about the house. I don't know. They were, you know, husbands and wives talk, right? And he walked into the other room and just kind of pouted. And like, he does it way funny. It's hilarious watching him do it, but... Well, she doesn't love me. She doesn't care about me. How many of y'all said that or thought it? 
Raise your hand if you've thought it, because we're not all alone. There you go, there you go, there you go. She doesn't, she doesn't thinking about me. And you know what God told him? It's none of your business whether she loves you. It's none of your business whether she cares about you or thinks about you. Oh, that might help some marriages right there. It's none of my business whether or not. No, I know he loves me because he's a good husband. But it's none of my business whether he loves me or not, thinks about me, cares about me. It's none of my business. It's my business. And the Lord went on to tell him, it's your business. It's my business to love him. To love God and love him. Believe in him. Think about him. Amen? That's my, and you know what? It works out really well that way because I've never had a dull moment in my marriage. And we have so much fun. We do. We have fun every day. Why? Even in the midst of chaos. Even in the midst of moving. Amen? Victim. One who gets the worst of all circumstances. An underdog. An injured party. A sufferer. A loser. I'm going to read that again if y'all want to take notes. This is victim. One who gets the worst of all circumstances, an underdog, an injured party, a sufferer, and a loser. We're not losers. <laughs> That's hilarious. We're not losers. Rick, we used to do sports camps, and Rick would make the kids say, y'all can repeat it, say, I'm a winner. Not a wiener. <laughs> it works great with kids. They laugh. <laughs> but it's true. you got to confess that you're a winner. Amen? What did we do when we first started? I'm more than victorious. I'm more than a conqueror. you got to talk yourself into this victor mentality. Amen? Otherwise, the little evil victim devil is going to be... He's annoying. Oh, he's so slick, but we're smarter than him. He's stupid. Satan is stupid. He, he has no new tricks. I promise you. The, the battle you might be going through right now or whatever obstacle you're believing God through, it is not new. It's not new. He's been doing the same thing ever since he's been on planet Earth. He's not new. He's old. He's wimpy. He's a loser. Satan, you're a loser. <laughs> if you claim or identify with this statement, I'm the one that was injured, you have stepped over into the victim status and rejected your conqueror status. See, Rick and I, when we felt like we were, when we found out we were going to have to move, it's just really inconvenient to have to move. We could have said, we're the injured party. You know, they treated us so awful. How could they do that? Right? How dare they? Do they not know we're children of God? I'm not telling you I didn't think it. But I don't say it. Now, now the business side of us was like, look, okay, at least do things above reproach, right? But we don't live in an above reproach world. We have to be the ones above reproach. Amen? And we can't give over into that pity and yeah, 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 yeah. I don't feel good. When you don't feel good, don't walk around the house saying, I don't feel good. And don't make everybody in the house pay for it. Goodness. Don't be cranky and gripey. I grew up in a house with three older sisters. And I tell you, I was, I was way younger. Like there's six years difference between me and the next one up. And I was determined because I lived through all their teenage years and their, you know, coming into womanhood, that stuff. And I was determined I'm not going to act like them when I get that age. I'm not going to be cranky. I'm not going to have all the same symptoms. I just refused. I was like, no. And you know what? I, I don't shift right? That's for women. Don't be shifty. Amen? But then guys, don't be wimpy. Because <laughs> girls are strong. Amen? But you are too because you got Jesus in you. So guys can be wimpy. Oh, I got a little scrape. I don't know what to do. <laughs> 
wives are like, really? I gave birth. <laughs> right? <laughs> so don't be wimpy. Don't be shifty. Don't be whiny. You're not saying, I'm not a whiner. Amen? It's whiny to be like that. You and me have to make a decision. We learned about this from Pastor Rick. You choose to be a conqueror or choose to be a victim. You choose. Say, I choose. Say this after me. If it's going to be, it's up to me. Say it again. If it's going to be, it's up to me. Say, it's not up to pastor. Did y'all get that? Pastor Justin and Pastor Annette cannot be your victory for you. Amen? But they can lead you. Amen? They're going to lead you always to victory. But you got to walk yourself. Amen? you got to take the steps. We can't do it for you. Okay, this is the fun part. Tessa, Eeyore. Oh, I never really liked Winnie the Pooh. Um, one of my sisters, Linda, liked it. My sister Linda, she loved Winnie the Pooh. I didn't really like Winnie the Pooh. I don't know. I just wasn't into it. I was, I was into Smurfs. <laughs> We're not into Smurfs because now we understand it. But that's what, that's what we look like when we whine and we gripe and we complain. And it's like, I can't believe they did that to us. How oh, they wronged us. You know what? They probably did wrong you. They wronged Jesus. What did he do? Stood there and took it for you and I. Amen? That's what we look like. That's the most pitiful looking creature on the face of the planet. All right. This is what we should look like. Maximus. (laughs) Isn't that awesome? We have a horse that was given to us. Um... And we're so blessed. We were given four horses, praise the Lord. The enemy stole one, so we were given four. All right. That's Maximus. I like Maximus. If you've ever seen Tangled, he's awesome. So we have a horse that looks like Maximus. He didn't act like that (laughs) yet, (laughs) but he will. (laughs) Okay, now flash both of them. Do we have the both of them? Did we get this? Which one do you want to be? Maximus. Amen. This is our choice every day. This choice is put before us. Amen. You have this choice and I have this choice every single day. We can choose to be Eeyore or we can choose to be Maximus. We can choose to be a poor, pitiful me, victim. It's all about me. All my problems are bigger than everybody else's, which is not true. That's a lie from the enemy. Or we could choose to be Maximus, who takes on the world. Amen? Y'all need to go watch Tangled so you can watch Maximus. Because I'm telling you, just, you know, just watch it. Even I'm an adult and I like kids' movies. You should too. It'll make you laugh. Choose this every day. Tell yourself to choose that. Get up in the morning and look at yourself in the mirror and say, I am a victor. I am not yielding. Amen? You got to talk to yourself. We got to talk to ourselves. Otherwise, the little whinies are going to come out. I want to shift over while we're talking about horses. This is a really cool story. Um, How many of you have seen the movie Secretariat? Okay. I like horse racing. I I don't gamble. The only reason why I like horse racing, because it's just so amazing to me to watch those horses run at full speed like that. And the, the heart of these horses, the champions, the, oh, it's just really cool to watch. Secretariat is a famous horse, racehorse. He lost only five races, but he did lose five races, okay? Very few two-year-olds have ever been named horse of the year, okay? He was a two-year-old named horse of the year. The first to run the Kentucky Derby in under two minutes. He was a champion, and he was beautiful, He was massive. Amen? In the Wood Memorial Stakes, he had an abscess on his lower lip causing him to lose. So if any of you guys have seen that, I think they put it in a different race. 
Um, but if you've, well, no, maybe not. But if you've ever seen that, he, he didn't run well, and they were like, what's wrong with him? He had an abscess. No one knew about it, and many thought his earlier wins were just flukes. Because of one loss, everyone began to doubt. Bicker, 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 bicker. There's people that are watching you, and you may be, you may be like, okay, say your race is way down there. You may be just like a quarter of the way on your race, and they're watching you. Well, it's not working. It's not working. I don't see much change in your life. You could choose to say, well, maybe it isn't. Or you just keep your eyes on the goal and say, you know what? Someday, whether it's a year, five years, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, who cares how long it takes? I'm going to be more than victorious. Amen? And not to show those people off because that's not what we do. But so I can give all honor and all glory to God. Amen? We need the heart of a champion. In the Belmont... The toughest of all races, Secretariat won by 31 lengths. And we're going to watch a clip from this. The most any horse had ever won by was six lengths. This is an amazing race. You're going to, you're going to be like, I, I get teary-eyed when I watch it just about every time. The normal weight of an average horse, horse is, um, a horse's heart is 8.5 pounds. Now, Secretariat's heart wasn't weighed when he died, they usually, they'll weigh the horse's hearts, but they weighed his um, rival, Sham. Sham was his rival, and it was 18 pounds. So they judged from Sham's heart, the same people knew how big Secretariat's heart, and they estimated his heart was 22 pounds. The average horse is 8.5 pound heart. Heart, right? He who has the biggest heart wins. What is our heart? It's our spirit man. Amen? We need to feed our hearts more than we feed our flesh. Go to Philippians 4, 8 in the Amplified. We've been in Philippians 4 in this series. Are y'all getting anything out of it? I know sometimes it's talking about this stuff. It's just not all that fun. But you know, when I was studying it, I was telling Rick, it's the same thing with... Um, working on music for me, you know, I don't, I don't work on music just so I can do this. But when I work on the stuff that we do on Sundays, I just treat it like it's just part of my worship. I'm not trying to perfect something so it sounds good for everybody, right? So it's the same thing with studying the Word. So for those of you who are teachers, study the Word. Don't study it for a sermon, just study it for you, and it'll come out in a message, amen? Because it's transformed you. Philippians 4, 8 in the Amplified. For the rest, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is worthy of reverence and is honorable and seemly, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely and lovable, whatever is kind and winsome and gracious, if there's any virtue and excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think on and weigh and take account of these things. Fix your minds on them. We have to feed our spirit. We feed our spirit like that. We feed our spirit on the word. We feed our spirit when we're praying on the Holy Ghost. That's why it's so important to have that prayer language. Amen. It builds us up. It edifies us. Amen. Let's go to, um, I want y'all to see this video real quick. Um, it's just the tail end of it. But I want, you, I want you to see it because I want you to see the heart of a champion. What you look like. This is what you look like when you make the decision every day to wake up and keep an upward focus and keep your eyes fixed on the goal and the price. Go ahead, Tess. It's secretary in a chair. Oh, man, this is a catastrophe.
That's impossible. <laughs> he laughs at fear, afraid of nothing. He does not shy away from the sword. He cannot stand still when the trumpet sounds. This is awesome. I'm telling you, I get tired, teary eyed every time I see that. That's the heart of a champion. His heart was so big, he could do it. Guess what? When our hearts are that big, we can do it. All things are possible to him who believes. It's not all things are possible. It's all things are possible to him who believes, who wakes up every day and makes the choice. I believe that I'm more than a conqueror. I believe in the promises of God. Amen? So you can't take all things are possible, and that's a cute little phrase. It's great on t-shirts and bumper stickers and all that kind of stuff, but you can't leave out for those who believe. Say, I believe. I'm going to read this to you. This is a dream that I had. I got on a boat, maybe a cruise ship, I couldn't try, quite tell, that was to take me to a beautiful island, a place where I would lay on the beach while I was served yummy tropical fruits and fresh seafood. That's my happy place, the beach. However, when I arrived, I ended up on a very small island that had no trees, no fruit, no seafood, no good people, only enemies trying to take me out. I was a little bit surprised in my dream. Obviously, I got on the wrong boat. Right? The Holy Spirit began to minister to me when I woke up that morning. He began to minister to me that walking down the path of victim is like getting on the wrong boat. It leaves you on an island by yourself, no nourishment, and in the enemy's territory. When you are a victim, guess what? Nobody wants to be around you. When I'm a victim, nobody wants to be around me. That's just the bottom line. People want to flock to champions. If you look behind you and nobody's following or you look around and nobody wants to be around you, then that's just, don't get all into condemnation because God is good. He can bring you up, okay? So I may be hard right now, maybe speaking hard, but you need to know we can't do it without the power of the Holy Ghost. Amen? Say, I cannot do this without God, without the Holy Ghost. Mm. Part of a job of a pastor, and I know Pastor, St pastor Justin and Ned have done this a lot, and they've done it for us too. So don't think your staff of your church is out of the area of correction. The joy of correction. Being corrected is not being abused. When you get corrected, you're not being abused, okay? And that goes kind of in this entitlement, victim mentality. We think, oh my goodness, how dare they say anything negative about me? I read this psalm the other day, a couple of nights ago, and I said, Rick, you gotta listen to this. Psalm 141, verse five in the New Living Translation. 
I encourage you to read the whole psalm, but for sake of time. Let the godly strike me. It will be a kindness. Now the godly strike me. If they correct me, it is a soothing medicine. And don't let me refuse it. Before this is a prayer of consecration to the Lord. He's saying, Lord, watch over my mouth. Keep my focus on you. And then he says, let the godly strike me. How many of us wake up every morning and say, oh, Lord, let somebody correct me today. <laughs> yes, yes, today, please. Yes. Do you want to be corrected? No. Paul had the heart of a champion, though. And he knew that being corrected means he's going to another level. Anytime we're corrected, it's because God loves us and he sees something in us that's going to hold us back from our destiny. Correction is good. Uh, let's go to Matthew 14, 24 through 31. <clears throat> oh, I have 28. 28 through 31, is that what it should be, Tess? And I think this one might be in the God's Word translation too. I'm not sure. So, Peter answered, Lord, if it is you, order me to come to you on the water. We all know this story. Jesus said, come. Now, first of all, it was Peter's idea to get out of the boat. Amen? I'm not sure Jesus would have said, hey, Peter, it's me. Why don't you come join me? I don't think he would have done that. But Peter said, if it's you, bid me come. So Jesus was like, all right, come right? So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water towards Jesus, but when he noticed how strong the wind was, he became afraid and started to sink. So his eyes were fixed upward, we could say. He got distracted, and all of a sudden it was inward, fear, right? And he shouted, Lord, save me. Immediately Jesus reached out, caught a hold of him, and said, you have so little faith. Why did you doubt? Now let me tell you the response of a victim. He's going to get back in the boat. He's going to go to the other corner of the boat. And he's going to get around his buds and say, can you believe he said I had a, whole, a little faith? Can you believe that? I walked on water. You guys didn't. And he's saying I don't have faith. How dare he say I don't have faith? That's the response of a victim. Amen? We can get so puffed up. Hey, look what I did. And then when someone says you can go further, we're like, but I, did you not see everything I just accomplished? And now you're telling me to go further? Yes. You can't do, you can't go further if your eyes are here. Because you'll celebrate a victory and then you'll sit. Hmm. All right. Peter didn't do that, actually. He didn't have that response. And he went on to become, we know, one of the greatest ministers, teachers, evangelists, apostles that ever lived. Amen. What did Jesus do? Jesus said, hey, this is a teaching moment. And I believe, I wish I could have heard the rest of that conversation. I believe Jesus probably said, hey, bud, come here. Let me, let me help you out here. <laughs> you did good, but you took your eyes off me. That's why you fell. That's when your faith went out the doors, when you took your eyes off me and went in. Amen? You will not reach your full potential in God and your ultimate place in him if you cannot take a rebuke and you cannot take correction. So get used to it. Amen? The peace of God. Begin to turn your focus upward. Amen? Peace does not mean to be in a place where there is no noise, trouble, or hard work. It means to be in the midst of those things and still be calm in your heart. Praise God for Pinterest. For those of you who are in worship practice, I found the quote. It means to be in the midst of those things and still be calm in your heart. Amen? John 14, 27 says, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give it unto you. Not as the world gives. I'm not a, I don't give and take. Amen? I'm just giving it to you. So don't let your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Amen? We choose whether or not we're going to walk in the peace of God. The only way we can walk in his peace is if we keep our eyes up and we keep our affection on him and we keep every, every thought, everything that comes at us, we, do it, we view it through the filter of God is good, amen, that God is faithful, that God is working on our behalf, amen? Oh, this is so good. 
We can't do it on our own. God never intended for us to do it on our own. 2 Corinthians 12, 7 through 9. I'm going to read this through pretty quick. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh. And a lot of people will preach a lot of not truthful messages on this. He didn't get sick. He didn't get his money taken away. No, it says right here in the scripture what it was, the messenger of Satan to buffet me. Lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice. He means he went to the Lord and was like, God, can you get rid of this, please? Can you get rid of Satan for me? And you know what God's response was? How many of you know it? My grace is sufficient for you. My grace, my empowerment that I've given to you is sufficient for you. My empowerment to do whatever you're called to do, grace, amen, is sufficient. It's more than enough for you to do whatever you're called to do, whenever you're called to do it, to overcome any obstacle, amen? You got to keep your eyes up though. The message translation, oh wait, 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 most gla- uh, my grace is sufficient for thee, my strength is made perfect in weakness, most gladly therefore will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. So when you got problems, just start shouting. Seriously, just start shouting because it'll confuse the devil. Satan will go, I just gave my best shot. Why are they not crying and whining and griping? Amen? The message translation says, I quit focusing on the handicap and began appreciating the gift, the gift of grace. We got to shift our focus. The only way we can do it, Luke 24, 49, the ultimate gift God gave us was the Holy Ghost. He said, stay in Jerusalem till you're endued with power from on high. Because let me tell you folks, you're not going to make it in this world without it. Amen. We got to have the Holy Ghost. Let's just close our eyes for a minute. Joseph, we're just going to sing the chorus. Okay, I just want you to lift your affections to the Lord. Amen. Sometimes you'll hear me say, make a big deal of God. Make God big. Well, God is huge. We can't, ma- we can't make him any bigger, but we can make him bigger in our thoughts. Amen. So if you ever hear me say that, now you know what it means. Father, we just lift our affections to you. You are big. You are strong. Oh, and you're mighty, Lord, you're mighty and you're good and you're faithful, God. Just begin to, out of your lips, just express, express your gratitude, express your faith. Amen. That's what true worship is, is expressing your faith and belief in who God is. Oh, you're good, you're good, you're always good. You're faithful, God. Oh, your grace is sufficient for us. Oh, your grace is more than enough. And you've made us conquerors. You've made us victors. Yes, you have, Jesus. Oh, we bless you, Lord. Begin to sing it. You are good. You're good. Oh, yeah. You are good. Yeah. You're good. Just keep singing. Oh, yes, you are good. You're good. Oh, yes, you are good. You're good. Oh, bless you, Lord. Bless you, Lord. Y'all stand up. Stand up. Oh, we honor you. Just lift your hands. Lift your hands. And if you've had a victim mentality, just let it go. Don't live in condemnation over this message. This is just God loving on us. Amen. Oh, we thank you, Lord. You're good. You never let us down. You are good. You're good. Oh. Yes, you are good, you're good, oh, you are good, 
Oh, you're good. Oh, you are good. You're good. Oh, come on, let faith arise. Yes, you are good. Yeah, you're good. Oh, yes, you are good. Oh, Lord, you're good. Oh, oh yes, you are good. You're good, oh, yes, you are good, yeah, you're good, oh, you're good, you're good, you're good, yes, you are good, you're good, oh, you are good, yes, you're good. you that in this place we got a bunch of victors so in the name of Jesus right now we take authority over any victim thought that we've had and we ask you supernaturally in the name of Jesus to uproot it and we thank you for planting a seed of victory on the inside us we choose to water that seed we choose to water that seed of victory. Say, I choose. Say it again. Say, I choose. Say, I choose to be a victor. I choose not to be a victim. Hmm. Glory to God. Say, I choose to keep my eyes up. And the focus of my soul up. Glory to God. Now just right now, just set your affections on Him. Oh, we love you, Father. We love you. That's all you gotta do when you feel like the whinies are coming. <laughs> Just lift your affections to Him. When fear tries to come in, lift your affections to Him. When anxiety tries to come in, lift your affections to Him. When you think you need a worry, lift your affections to Him. And that victim, that victim will fall off. Glory to God. We love you, Lord. We love you, Lord. We thank you for your word. And I just decree that it is seeded into the hearts of rich soil and it will produce a mighty harvest of victors. I thank you, Father, for it. You are faithful. Your word doesn't return to you void. It goes forth and it does accomplish what it is set forth to do. We receive it from you, Father, in the name of Jesus. Glory to God, glory to God.